Hey, would you turn to two places in your Bible? Luke chapter 2. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 1. We have the Christmas story in two places. They read from Luke 2. Matthew 1. And then 1 John. Toward the back of your Bible. 1 John. I was reminded this week about one of my favorite childhood stories, and uh, it goes way back. I'm embarrassed to tell you how old the book is, so I won't, but it was called Hector Crosses the River, and turns out there was a series of books about a, a bumbling hero, if you will, who seemed to stumble onto heroic, uh, historic points of time in history. And in this particular case, Hector Heathcote, the main character, was a builder of boats. And it was Christmas Day, 1776, and George Washington came to him in need of boats in a hurry. George needed to cross the river. And so, in fact, there's a famous painting of George Washington crossing the Delaware River. But it turns out, since Hector had been caught off guard, that there was a hole in the boat, in the bottom of Hector's boat that George needed to rent right away. But it was a finger-sized hole. And so Hector volunteered nobly to get the money for the rent to ride in the bottom of the boat with his finger in the hole. And so the last page, I think I have a picture of the last page there, and it says, and that is how Hector Heathcote crossed the Delaware River with George Washington. You can't see Hector in the picture because he's down at the bottom with his finger in the hole. And then the last line, you if you hadn't if he hadn't been there, you never know what would have happened. So Christmas Day, 1776, the history of our country hung in the balance for Hector Heathcote's finger right in the bottom of the hole of the boat. Now, a fictional story that uh, inspired, I don't know, a little boy to. I don't know what it inspired me to do, but it's a fun little story. Anyway, now a lot of people look at Jesus' arrival and his life and then his death as some sort of tragic accident that took place. Like God had this plan going and Jesus was going to live a good moral life. And then it all went awry. He got arrested. Oh, no. Now they're taking him clear to the cross. Are you kidding me? This has gone spun way out of control. And a lot of people look at Jesus' life and his death and such as a a mixed up plan that wasn't supposed to be. And uh, Christmas reminds us that it was exactly as God planned in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. It tells us that Jesus came right at the exact time when the fullness of time had come. God sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law. Jesus came at exactly the right time. It was a plan. It wasn't some accident of nature. It wasn't like he stumbled upon it. It actually happened. So I want to read in Luke, uh, Matthew chapter one, and then go to first John one and kind of expand on the key phrase from Matthew one, verse 18 of Matthew one. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother, Mary, was betrothed to Joseph, before they had come together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son and you will call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. That phrase, Emmanuel, God with us, was a new mindset for the Jewish people of the first century. And it's a new mindset for anybody that has looked at religion or viewed God. So many uh, religious systems have God as some distant deity out there. And the whole thought that God could 
become flesh and lived among us is stunning. Now, the book of First John expounds on that. So if you would turn over and we're going to spend the bulk of our time in First John chapter one, the first four verses. And John, one of Jesus' disciples, explains even more about what it means to be God with us. Take a look at verse one. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, revealed, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested or revealed to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. I want to draw some some things out of this about what it really means to have God with us, Emmanuel. And the first thing I would note is Christmas really happened. It's not some fictional story. It's not an inspiring story. It's not a legend that happened. We don't have to imagine somebody down in the bottom of the boat. It happened. Christmas actually happened. The details are given to us throughout the story that are verifiable. Caesar Augustus was emperor of Rome and he gave a decree that all the world should be taxed. Herod was the Jewish king. Real people are discussed. Names and places. Jerusalem and Bethlehem are real places that are presented. We have in our day talk about fake news, right? Well, these things about Jesus can be verified. They can be validated. That which was from the beginning. Does that sound familiar, that phrase, that which was from the beginning, the way First John starts? Sound anything like in the beginning from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The fact is, history, if you look at it, there has two beginnings, creation and Christ. In fact, they have, historians forever have looked at history as B.C. and A.D. That's being changed now to what? The C.E. Common Era to eliminate references to Christ. But there's the first beginning, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created. And then in the second beginning, Christ came on the scene. Now, note the progression here, what's described. That which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled. Now, he's not just developing some sort of rhetorical flourish. He's not just a writer that's building on things. He's actually giving legal terminology, the levels of witness to an event. And we have the same kind of level. So think about it. If we take them in in sequence, that which we have heard. Have you ever been around some event or incident and you say something like this, I heard something and then I turned and looked and I realized what was going on. I heard something and I think it came from over there. Sort of the intro level to being a witness to something. And the second one, I we have seen with our eyes and maybe you've said before, I saw something out of the corner of my eye and then I turned and I was going down the road and something caught my eye off to the side. But there's other things that you've said, I was looking right at it when it happened. I can't believe it. I I was right there. I was looking right at it. And the fourth level where he says our hands have handled. And you may have been a witness to something that you were right in the middle of. I was right there. It was happening all around me. Every time seemed to slow down and it happened in slow motion as things began to happen. John says, I saw Jesus and I can't stop talking about him. I'm that excited about it. These aren't just nice stories about Jesus. They actually happened. Another thing we learn here from this is that salvation is by 
grace. It's by grace. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, Jesus is called the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Here in verse 1, he's called uh, the Word of Life. And in verse 2, it references eternal life. This eternal life is Christ. Christ is eternal life. The religious leaders of the world can point to eternal life. They can talk about eternal life. They can show the way that they say is to eternal life. They can say, this is the way, follow me. But only Jesus, when you look at the belief systems of the world, only Jesus can say, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the life. Now, when we follow him, we put our faith in him. We come to unite with him in a way that grows us into eternal life, in a way that gets us eternal life. It's not something that we achieve. It's not something that we attain. So often people say, well, as long as you live a good life, it doesn't really matter what you believe. As long as you live a good life. That's self-salvation. You earn the right to, to heaven with God. Or some people just reject religion altogether and say, within my own moral values, I'm living a good life. I've got enough of it within my own moral values. Now, the person that says, whether I accept religion or not, my moral values will get me there. Or the person that says, I'm going to be very religious and force God to bless me and force God to let me into heaven. There's some dangerous, concerning attitudes in that. Some harmful ones. One is fear and insecurity. There's some people that live with such fear and insecurity. They never think they're good enough. They never feel like they've arrived. They always wonder, am I... In good standing with God or not? Have you done enough? Have I done enough? When will I ever know? Do you know if you're right with God? Do you know where you're going to spend eternity? Well, I hope so. Another harmful attitude is one of pride. And it disregards other people. Pride says, I'm better than. I've arrived. I can do it. I have it within myself. I actually am good enough to warrant God's blessing. I actually am good enough to arrive. That's a dangerous, dangerous, harmful attitude to have. A third one is self-hatred, where you think, man, I've failed. I'm no good. There's no chance that I'll ever recover. There's no way I'll ever climb out of this hole that I'm in. I'm not good enough. And those three describe the vast majority of people in our world. The vast majority of people, many are living with fear and insecurity. I've got to be more religious. If I just do more religious things, then maybe, hopefully, I'll be acceptable to God. Some are living with pride. I've arrived. I'm doing lots of religious. I'm a good person. I'm better than them, at least. And some live in complete despair. I'm a mess. God wouldn't have me. I've dug such a deep hole. I could never get out of this hole again. But there's an alternative. We could believe the truth about Christmas. We could believe that Jesus Christ has already paid the price for us. That he's already done it for us. That we are saved by grace, the goodness and mercy of God. And when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and we unite with him, now we have uh, an identity that humbles us out of our pride. And we have an identity that loves us out of our insecurity. We find a forgiveness that overcomes whatever despair or however far down we think we've sunk. Christmas happened. It teaches us right here in Scripture. We've heard about it. We've seen it. We've gazed at it and our hands have handled the word of life. 
The third one. Christmas happened. It's by grace. Fellowship with God is possible. Verse three. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son, Jesus Christ. God with us. Fellowship. Next month, we're going to begin a series on the book of Exodus. It's called Deliverance. I'm quite excited about it. We're going to go from January to May. And look at God's deliverance of the Hebrews from slavery in Egypt and make the comparison to our own bondage of sin and deliverance that God offers. There's a lot of parallels from the uh, Passover lamb to Christ's death as Passover lamb, the tabernacle, the dwelling and presence of God to the Holy Spirit living in us, the dwelling and presence of God. But one of the things fascinating in the book of Exodus, God called Moses up on Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments and the law. And while he was up there, um, well, Exodus 24 is one of the passages that describes that 24 and verse one. God calls Moses up there and he says, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel. And then here's this phrase. Worship from afar. Worship from afar. And the cloud, the glory of God came down over that mountain and there were thunderings and lightnings. Everybody was scared to go near the mountain. God said, don't go near the mountain or you're going to die. John says, we not only heard about him, our hands Handled God in the flesh. This was a complete new mindset for the first century Jewish people who had grown up hearing you worship God from afar. You worship him from a distance. In Exodus chapter 33, Moses said to God, show me your glory. I want to see you in all of your glory. And God said, nobody that sees my glory can't even live to tell about it. Then we come to the birth of Christ. And in John chapter one and verse 14, we see that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And look at this phrase. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. God with us, fellowship with God is now possible. What had once been this distance, creator, awesome, powerful, holy God. With Christ makes fellowship with God personal. Other religions don't really allow for the possibility of a personal relationship with God. Theologians use the term the incarnation, the incarnation. Incarnate, the taking on of flesh. God who lived in eternity past, God the Son, took on human form, took on the flesh. Fellowship with God is possible. John goes on in his explaining what it means to be Emmanuel, God with us. He wants us to have joy in verse 4. These things we write to you that your joy may be full. Joy is possible, and he wants us to have that. Doesn't expect Christians to go around moping through life. Joy is something he wants us to have. Joy is, well, in Luke 2, the announcement from the shepherd, or the angel to the shepherds. I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Luke chapter 2. Joy was a theme of Christ in his words and a theme of John's writings. A couple of examples from John 15 and verse 11. Uh, Jesus is saying, these things I've spoken to you that my joy would remain in you and that your joy would be full. That sounds like first John because it's a theme of his that this fellowship with Christ is intended for us to have joy. 
John 16 and verse 22. uh, Another one. Uh, Therefore, you now have sorrow. But I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and your joy. No one will take from you. Jesus, that was at the Last Supper. He's about to be arrested and tried and crucified. And he says, you're going to have sorrow here for a little while. But what's between the words there, when you see the resurrection, you're going to have a joy that no one can take from you. And then chapter 17, three chapters in a row, joy comes up in John 17 and verse 13. But now I come to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. Christmas really happened. And the joy that Christmas brings is because of the presence of God. His love, his care, a clear sense of purpose, no guilt because we've been forgiven of our sins, a clear sense of identity that handles, humbles us in our pride and forgives us of our sins, a satisfaction that's found only in him. One more thought on God with us. And that is that he came in such ordinary means. He came through such an ordinary means. The kids did such a great job singing about the Christmas story. It's worth going to tell on the mountain. But we often miss the depth of it because of the ordinary nature of it all. Blue collar family, simple parents, stable Shepherds, a baby. That's not how I would have done it. We want spectacle, right? We want flash, right? What happens? It's um, award season in uh, Hollywood, I guess. I see commercials on television. Maybe you watch those uh, Academy Awards and such. How do they show up? How do they arrive at those events? Red carpet, the limousine pulls up photographers everywhere. They're wearing their best clothes. Wouldn't you think if the savior of the world was arriving, you'd have some photographers alerted to be there and record the scene. Some of you have been to Chiefs games and they, uh, when they introduced the Chiefs players, I've seen photos, fire and smoke is going. It's quite a scene when the players run out there. Now, wouldn't you think if the Messiah of the world was coming, You'd have fire and smoke. Remember when the space shuttles were flying? and uh, Man, people would be watching. The television camera would be picking it up. They'd pick it up. We've spotted it over California. Now it's over Texas. It's over the Gulf of Mexico. And all over the country, people would be watching, tuned in, tracking with the space shuttle. He's about to arrive. Wouldn't you think the Messiah would have some kind of announcement like that? Finally, it lands, vehicles rush out there, the astronauts climb out. He's here, he's here. That's, I would have done it something like that. Or maybe here would be my favorite way I would have brought the Savior to the world. When those blue angels fly, they're precision flying instruments. And they land those aircraft, the power and the noise, the thrust. It's awesome. And they get out and the pilots climb down and they're sharp, the precision of it all. Who can't be impressed with that? Who's not intimidated by all that? And he came as a baby. And he announced it to shepherds. We learned last week that shepherds were about as low as you could go on the social totem pole in that culture. God is constantly upending the value system that the world lives by. He seems to thrive on that. He chooses David, the youngest son that nobody even remembers. Oh, oh, we have another son. I think he's out with the sheep. They pick him. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, There's a couple of scriptures that... Show us God's values. He upends the whole value system of the world. God has chosen the foolish things of the world 
to put to shame the wise. God's chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. It goes on, verse 28. The base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. The Christian life begins not with smoke and fire, not with thrust and power, but in the simple, most ordinary act of humbling oneself before God. He defies the world's expectations by calling on us to humble ourselves like a child. The humility, the innocence, the trust. And then the the life, the spiritual life God desires in us and the joy that he wants to grow in us occurs throughout our lives in almost commonplace ways. We show up at church on a regular basis. We read our Bibles when nobody's looking. We pray from our heart to God's. There's no smoke and fire. There's no grand announcement. Maybe we should have smoke and fire. Here comes the Smiths into church today. Here come the Jones. No, it's ordinary, commonplace experience where God does his work. Don't be put off by the commonplace of it all. Don't be seeking a spectacle. Our fellowship with God grows in very ordinary ways. Those prayers as you're driving down the road, reading your Bible when no one's looking and serving our brothers and sisters without any thank yous, without any notifications, depending on Jesus during hard times that no one else would understand, even if you could try to explain it to him. The ordinary times of life are exactly where God meets us, are exactly where God with us, Emmanuel, preserves us. Would you bow your heads with me, please? You know, the religions of the world offer, and they offer advice to us. Here's how you get right with God. Here's the things you need to do. Here's what you need to say. Here's where you need to go. Here's the advice on how to get right with God. Christianity is an announcement. The Savior of the world has come. Find your joy in him. Find your satisfaction. Eternal life is in him. And it's possible that you're here and you've never, ever put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. There never was a time when you heeded the announcement. In this ordinary time and place, a prayer from your heart to God's. God, I'm a sinner. And I'm humbling myself before you. Just tell God that. And let God know that you understand Jesus Christ came. and He lived and he died for you. Let God know of your commitment and desire to follow him. Offer God thanks for the eternal life that he gives in Christ. I wonder if you're here and that was your prayer just now. You'd never before 
received Christ. But today you prayed and invited Christ into your life. No one's looking around, but I wonder if you would slip your hand up and say, that was my prayer just now to receive Christ into my life. Who would raise their hand and say, that was my prayer. For the rest of us. How often are we looking for spectacle? I need God to show up big in my life. And he meets us in the ordinary. And we tend to discount the ordinary. How about a firm resolve? God, I'm going to begin looking for you in the ordinary. I'm going to begin pursuing that which isn't flashy, that which doesn't come with a lot of pats on the back. I'm going to seek you in that way. God in heaven. I thank you for God in the flesh. We don't have to worship you from afar. We don't have to worship you with fear and intimidation. Afraid to go anywhere near the lightning and the thunder. You became flesh. And we read about those that heard you and saw you and gazed upon you. Thank you. In Jesus' name.